Oh, uh, uh, hello, everyone. First, welcome to this young humor seminar. So, uh, my name is Wenbo Zhang, so a second year PhD student in ISD. So in this semester, I'm helping my advisor, Amelia Yuda, to organize th this uh, series seminar. So today is our first talk. So we are happy to have uh, Chuang Kai Ling, a final year PhD student from CMU to share his research related to the intersection of uh, game theory and uh, real, world, it's real world application. So shall we start? Yeah, okay. So uh, uh, give me one second. Let me check. Uh, let me check. Uh, 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 gosh, could could you hear us? Yeah, I can hear. It. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I think he. Uh, yeah, I I, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. Can you say something? Uh, gosh. Uh, no. Can... Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, let's get started. So, uh, thank you for for the introduction and um, uh, welcome to to my thank you for attending my talk. So, um, this talk is titled "Towards Scalable Game Theoretic Approaches for Addressing Social Challenges." Um, can I just have a show of heads? Like, how many of you are interested in game theory, and how many of you are interested in the social aspects? Like, who's interested in game theory? Okay. Uh. Okay, so I uh, I will try to make this more accessible for everyone by and large. Um, I I don't think it's 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 too complicated, but feel free to ask questions. Um, if you are if you are um, concerned about anything, I think there are quite few people, so I'll try to keep this as informal as possible. Okay, I want to so first confess, right? Uh, for those of you who are interested in social challenges, uh, I I haven't actually deployed anything yet. But a lot of these problems that I'm facing, technical problems, will be sort of uh, motivated by what I see others, uh, problems that I, that I see other people face. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so today's talk will be about game theory. And for those of you who are not familiar, game theory is essentially a framework for us to talk about uh, strategic interactions in multi agent systems. Okay, so Perhaps the most eye-catching examples, and there's some chats over there. I'm not sure if, uh, anyway. <laughs> can you just... Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, so for those of you who, perhaps the most eye-catching examples of game theory would be in recreational examples, uh, recreational games, in particular, poker, StarCraft, and Go. Okay, so these are games which are so complicated. For example, in poker, there are so many states that you have to deal with, um, and it's really difficult to solve some of these games. And on top of that, we also have other applications like diplomacy, stratego, and so on and so forth. And these are so these are games that are so difficult that more than 10 years ago, we won't even be trying to attempt to solve them. So what makes some of these games interesting strategically? Right? Uh, the first thing is that these are games that are played on very, very big game trees. Right? As I just mentioned, a game of poker can have like 10 to the 100 plus uh, possible states. And that's just too big for us to even come close to traverse. So trying to solve these games is very difficult. And on top of that, if you're playing against a good bot, you will seem like, you know, you have to sort of think many steps ahead to do well. Now the second thing that also comes out quite frequently is something called imperfect information. So in a game like poker, um, you don't know your opponent's cards. So that gives rise to a lot of interesting behavior like bluffing or lying or coercion and so on and so forth, right? So combined together, this would be what we call extensive form games. So extensive form games basically is a formal way to describe both of these phenomena. I won't go into it in detail because it's too technical, but um, if you want to Google it, this is the term that you want to search for. So what about real world applications, right? We talked about recreational games. It turns out that in the real world, there have been a lot of applications as well, quite a number of them at least. And the most notable one uh, in the past 10 years or so is that of security games. So security games, uh, which was popularized about 10 years back by Milan Tanbe. He used to be in USC, now he's in Harvard. Um, it's essentially a way for us to talk about how to allocate defensive resources to protect certain targets. 
So for example, it can be used to schedule patrols for the US Coast Guard. In fact, it has been used for that. Uh, it has also been used to sort of um, uh, uh, reason about where to place security checkpoints in airports. And lastly, in anti-poaching uh, activities. So you want to plan how to dissuade poachers from doing what they want to do. So these, as you might have imagined, also have those two properties that I was talking about in the previous two slides, right? They're played on very, very large game trees. There are many, many possible routes of patrol. And they also have imperfect information. For example, if you always patrol around the same route over and over again, you become predictable, and then the poachers are just going to avoid you, right? So you have to be strategic, you have to be uh, unpredictable. So what's really impressive is that these are actual deployments in the real world. It isn't just like you know, me writing one paper and then that's it, right? They, they were actually used in the real world by real people. But if I were to be honest, um, there are not many applications and deployments out there, right? Compared to the recreational setting that I was talking about earlier. So why is that so? The first thing is that maybe computer scientists, we are, you know, kind of uh, allergic to sunlight. We don't like to walk out of our, our, our desk. But I think from a technical perspective, there are two challenges that need to be addressed. The first one is the problem of missing game parameters. And the second one is a problem with uh, scalability when solving very large general sum games. So I'm gonna briefly describe these two uh, problems. So missing game parameters. So when it comes to applications of games, in most settings, we will assume that the game is specified to us upfront. So this will include things like the player utilities, meaning, how much each player is going to get when the game ends, and also can include things like transition probabilities. So it means that if I move forward, uh, where will I end up in the future? So without these parameters, it's actually very difficult to analyze or certainly difficult to solve the game, right? You can't get anywhere without these specifications. Now, a very natural question to ask is where do these utilities or specifications come from? Right? It's a very difficult problem in, in, in practice. And, oops, sorry. And the truth is that in real life, it's extremely difficult to specify games. Unlike recreational games where these payoffs or transitions are given by the rules of the game. So here's an example of what actually happens. Uh, this is an example of anti-poaching and this was done by my advisor many years back in 2016. Um, here, what they're trying to do is to model this game between an anti-poaching game as a game between two players, a patroller and a poacher. And what they do here is to try to use the animal density in a particular area as a proxy for the utility in that, in that square, in that, in that area. So how do you get this animal density? The first is to try to physically explore the area themselves. So they literally go there and, and do their, 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 their research. And the second method is to try to consult the experts, the rangers in the area, and ask them for their opinion. And the problem with that is that it's kind of arbitrary. They just say like, oh, you know, yeah, here is like kind of many, many animals here, here not so much. It's actually really, really subjective. Now to make this even more difficult, you have to consider other factors. Uh, for example, on the left, on, on, a, on a picture on the center, um, the orange path is the path that the algorithm recommends, but the actual path that is taken is actually the black one. So why is that such a discrepancy? Because it turns out that uh, there are actually, there's actually a river and some ridge over there that makes traversing the vertical part extremely difficult. So you have to take all these things like ruggedness of the terrain into account as well. So that in all, what, what this means is that trying to get these utilities is actually something that's either very tiring or extremely costly and potentially very subjective as well. So by and large, you want to avoid it if possible. Okay, so the second problem is that of scalability. So something more related to computer science. Um, and specifically for general sum games. So what do I mean by general sum games? General sum games are basically games which are neither fully cooperative or not nor competitive. And in fact, in fact, many real world problems are general sum. For example, even in the case of airport security, you might think it's competitive, but the truth is that some targets are not that valuable uh, to the defender, right? But they might be very valuable to the attacker. Right? And similarly, for cybersecurity, some cyber attacks are actually relatively benign. You can just let them happen if, they, if they're not too dangerous. So most real-world games, in fact, are actually general sum in nature. Right? Anything involving politics or economics, and even the classic world games like you know, Prisoner's Dilemma, for those of you who know about it, these are all general sum games. The truth is that the zero-sum assumption that was very, very popular, that we, a very popular assumption that we make, is actually one that is made usually out of mathematical convenience rather than actual fact. So what's the big deal? What's the problem in general sub games? There are many problems actually. 
Uh, I'm going to focus on computational aspect because that's actually the easiest one in practice. And that is that solving general sum games is typically intractable. Intractable just means that it takes a long time to solve the game, uh, even for very small games. And this is in contrast to the zero sum games that we see in the recreational setting, right? It's solvable in what we call polynomial time, which is very fast. So on the right, for the computer science people, I have a breakdown of the computational complexity of solving something called the stack over equilibrium. And I'll talk, I'll talk about what that is in a moment. But uh, basically, you can see that everything is empty hard. Empty hard just means very difficult to solve. Now, the truth is that actually, even for zero sum games, it's still quite challenging because the game tree is very large. But there are many methods out there to handle this. Um, in games like chess and poker and pool. And that is actually what allowed us to get all the superhuman performance in these games. But there are almost no such approximations or heuristics available for general sum games. Right? And this is actually a hole that I wish to fill up. OK, so uh, that's it for the, uh, the, the motivation part. Now I'm going to just briefly describe the agenda for the rest of the talk. And this talk is going to be split into three portions. The first portion I'm going to talk about inverse game theory, which is going to be a framework for us to address the issue of missing game parameters, in some cases at least. And in the next two parts, I'm going to talk about two methods to deal with uh, scalability when solving general sum games. So I will try to keep this as high level as possible. I think not everyone here is a computer scientist. Um, so um, yeah, don't worry about it. If you, if you, if you have any questions, you can just ask me at this point, okay, but it should be accessible. Okay. So let's start off with inverse game theory. So when we talk about game solving, typically this is what we have in mind, right? We have a game on the left, this is rock, paper, scissors. I think that should be clear enough. So rock, paper, scissors, and what we want to do is to try to solve it, and this gives us an equilibrium, or what we call the solution to the game, right? In this case, this will be the uniform strategy. The optimal strategy is to play uniformly at random. And that kind of makes sense intuitively. Now over here, I'm now interested in the inverse problem. Right? And what this means is that I have some game, but I don't know what the payoffs are. So I don't know what happens if two players play rock and scissors, for example. But what I do have are some samples from people who are playing the game. So these are like A1 and A2 and A3 are samples from people who are playing the game. And I'm trying to go the opposite direction, which is to infer what these utilities are right, using these samples. So this becomes an inference problem. Now, in practice, things are usually a little bit more complicated. Right? We don't usually play the same game over and over again, especially in the real world. Um, for example, if you play a game of StarCraft, just as an example, um, the effectiveness of each strategy is dependent on some side information in case the map of the game. Right? Or if you're playing a game of sports, how good or how bad a strategy is depends on, say, the weather or the terrain you know, in tennis, for example. So all this is captured in something what we call side, what we call side information, given by X over here. And now the utilities are going to be functions of this site information. They're no longer constants. And our goal is to try to learn these functions that map site information to utilities. Right? So this is to try to help us handle the case where the game is ever changing over time. So here's the problem setting slightly more formally. Right? We, are, we have many rounds of a zero sum game that's been played. And this is an assumption that we're making for technical purposes. And in each round, we're going to observe some site information or features. Right? So this is the weather of the day so on and so forth. And we also have an unobserved payoff matrix. So that is the, the payoff matrix for paper scissors in the previous example. That is a function of this side information and is parameterized by some unknown parameters phi. So what we're trying to do over here is that we're going to assume that the players are playing according, in accordance to what we call the quantile response equilibrium. And this is just some kind of bounded rationality, some kind of regularized version of the Nash equilibrium that accounts for, for bounded rationality. So this is to handle the case where the players are not necessarily playing optimally, because in real life, that's, that's usually what happens. Okay, so our goal now is to try to use this data set of site information, you know, the weather that day, and the actions that were observed in that day, and try to infer what these unknown parameters phi actually are. Right? So this is like a supervised learning problem, roughly speaking. So our method will give uh, what we call the first end-to-end -end gradient based approach, which allows for side information. And this is a mouthful. Um, don't worry about the details. I'll get to that in a moment. So as I mentioned, this does look like a, um, a supervised learning problem. And our solution will also look like a supervised learning um, approach. So this is a standard like deep learning architecture that I think uh, many of you who are into machine learning will, would have heard of. 
And what we're trying to do is they're trying to learn these parameters phi using gradient descent. It's quite straightforward. So what's going to happen is that we start off with this uh, side information in our data set. And we're going to put this through our, what we think are the parameters of the game. And this will spit out the payoff matrix in accordance to what we think it is. And then once we do have the payoff matrix, we're going to pump this through the game solver. And this is going to spit out the equilibrium solution uh, of that particular game. Right, in this case, given by u and v. And once we have that, we can compare that to the actions that were actually observed. We can compute a loss, and then we can propagate gradients backwards all the way through this uh, game solver and to the parameters, go backwards. And once we have that, we can update uh, our parameters phi using gradient descent. Right? So this is a, a kind of a standard procedure that's very common in machine learning. What is interesting, however, is the fact that this game solver it is how do we propagate gradients through this game solver. Right, the game solver is an optimization procedure, right? Um, and typically we don't, we, we, we typically we don't uh, propagate gradients through an optimization procedure. So that's the main contribution of this work, at least. So the forward pass basically is just this game solving process. I won't get into it because it's standard, um, it's, it's standard things in the literature. But the backward pass is a bit more interesting, as I mentioned. So the sub goal here is to compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the payoff matrix. Oh, sorry, the gradient of the payoff matrix with respect to the loss. And loosely speaking, what this means is that we need to find the direction in which to can jitter this payoff matrix such that the loss would decrease the most. So it turns out that this can be done. Uh, it's based on uh, using uh, methods from a larger area known as differentiable optimization. Um, if you are curious, you can be obtained by applying the implicit function theorem to the KPT conditions. Um, I won't get into the detail, but what is important is that this expression over here for the gradients is something that is in closed form, right? It's just solving a linear system. It is not unrolling the optimization process. There are no crazy recursion formulas and that sort of thing, right? It's something that is physically computable uh, in, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time. So here are some examples uh, just to sort of illustrate this. Uh, on the left, I have this example of one card poker. It's a very, very small game. Right, where you have a very simplified version of per poker with just four cards. And the catch here is that the cards are non-uniformly distributed. Right? And you're trying to infer what, that is, what is this, this distribution by observing the actions of each player. And at the bottom, each plot over there is for a different card distribution. And on the x-axis, I have the number of training samples and the y-axis is how wrong we are uh, in the, the card distribution. And you can see that even when there are very few training samples, we can learn this pretty accurately. And this is a kind of a small game, so that's kind of easier. We can also scale this up to much larger games. Now on the right, I have this feature-wise version. Uh, it reads feature-wise rock, paper, scissors um, covered over there. And here is the case where you have a function of site information as your utilities, right? And we assume this to be a linear function, right? So our goal is now to learn this linear mapping theme. And you can see again on the bottom right that we are able to learn this pretty well when we have enough training samples. When you have very few, very few, then everything is kind of off. And that's kind of expected uh, when you don't have a lot of training data. So I have a whole bunch of other contributions. Um, I won't get into that in detail. Um, we propose something, um, a new model of bounded rationality. And this is something called the nested logic QRE. And it avoids some of the known pathologies in behavioral science, even in the single player setting. So we extended that to the multiplayer setting. Uh, we also have some computational speed ups using first order methods. And back then, this was like the fastest method uh, five years back. Now, there are much faster methods based on regret minimization. But yeah, uh, things have moved, things move pretty quickly. Okay, so that's all inverse game theory, right? The, 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 in a nutshell, the main point I want to, be, to, to put across is that this game solver can be treated as a differentiable function of game parameters. And then we can use that to learn. Uh, the game parameters uh, using gradient descent. Okay, so I'll get, I'll get into subgames uh, in, into the second part of the talk. But before I do that, I, I want to sort of have a short tutorial on what's the difference between zero and general subgames, right? And I will do this in the context of something known as the stack over equilibrium. So uh, this will be a very short tutorial about what that is. So I'm going to use an example called the disgruntled employee game. And maybe for those of you who are in computer science, this is uh, given the job market now, this is maybe a little bit inappropriate, but uh, this is the running example for the rest of the talk. So this is a game that's played on the game tree on the left. It's between two players, the company and the employee. 
So the company is someone known as the leader, right? And the employee is known as the follower. And these are not interchangeable. These are distinguished positions. So the game goes like this. The employee has a, has a competing offer and is considering resignation. He's thinking about quitting. And if he does, the leader, the first player, the leader, is going to get a payoff of zero, right? He's going to lose his superstar employee. But the employee is going to get a payoff of two because he gets a, a better job. Now, if he does decide to stay in the company, the company now has two options, to give him a raise or to not give him a raise. And if it gives him a raise, uh, the company will get a payoff of 50 because at least he gets to keep his employee. But the employee is super happy because he gets a payoff of three. He gets an even higher salary, before, higher payoff than before. Now, if you don't get a raise, then the company is super happy. He gets a payoff of 100. Employee is not so happy. He gets a payoff of one. So the question here is, if you are the company, how should you behave such as to maximize your overall utility? Okay, we're always, we're always thinking from the company's viewpoint. So intuitively, you might come to such a naive solution, which is to do things by backward induction, right? So you assume that from the company's perspective, if the employee has already decided to stay in the company, then you can just milk whatever you want out of that person, right? Just, you know, not, don't, not give him the raise, obviously, just exploit them as much as possible. The problem with that is that if the employee knows this, then he's going to leave the game. He's going to leave the game to begin with, right? And you are going to get a payoff of zero. Now, you can try to be generous, which is the opposite thing. Always offer him a raise, and that works, right? You will get a payoff of 50. The question is, can we do better? <clears throat> and the answer is yes. And here's how you do it better. What I'm going to do is, to, is that I'm going to sit down with the employee up front and tell him, okay, if you stay in, if you stay in the company, I'm going to toss a coin. And if it comes out as hits, you're going to get a raise. And if it comes out as tails, you're not going to get a raise. And you can convince yourself that on average, the employee is going to get a payoff of two, right? One in the average of one and three is going to be two. And that's just enough to entice him to stay in the company, right? We, tie, we assume tie breaks are done arbitrarily. And from the company's perspective, he's going to get a payoff of 75 in expectation, right? So that's much better than the previous two alternatives. So what's going on here? There are two things that I want you to take away. The first is that the company was able to achieve this by sort of telling the employee upfront about what's going to happen. And this is what we call the power of commitment. It's, it's, it's actually what drives the stack over equilibrium, right? This, the fact that a leader could commit to a particular strategy. And the second thing that I think is even more important is that over here, we had this disgruntled employee and we had to incentivize him uh, to stay, right? We have to give him a carrot, something to keep him there. Now in the alternate universe, maybe the employee is actually underperforming and maybe you want to get rid of him without paying any severance package. So you might want to make life very difficult for him such that he leaves out of the court, right? And sometimes you have to threaten him with some bad outcomes. So the point I want to make is that it's not about being nice, it's not about being nasty. It's that sometimes in real life, in general, some games, you have to give something to get something, right? This is very typical of what happens in reality. And our game solvers need to take this into account. So now, uh, hopefully you understand the difference between general sum and zero sum games, how they have characteristics. Things are a little bit more complicated. I'll get to sub game resolving or sub game solving. So this is gonna be a little bit technical, but I think with some examples, you can get the idea. So the problem here, as I mentioned right at the start of the talk, is that uh, the games are too difficult, are too large for us to solve, right? So what are some methods to overcome this? So consider a game of chess. The game tree is too large to traverse. So what do you do? We do something called depth-limited search, which means that we start from a particular stage, from a particular state, we perform some search to a limited depth, we make a move, and when it's our turn again, we perform search once more from that new state and repeat that over and over again. So this is very useful because it avoids search from the states which you never visit in practice in real life. But uh, and it can be extended to, 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 to imperfect information games as well. And in fact, it's a crucial part of poker bots today. So this talk, I'm going to show how to do that for general sum games. And the idea, if you, are, if you ever get lost, is to just keep in mind characteristics. Right? That's what is important over here. And in particular, our method is going to be safe, which, is, which means um, it has some performance guarantees. I'll explain that in the next slide. Oops. Interesting. Uh, what is happening here? Okay. Uh, subtitles. <laughs> we don't want that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay, so what is sub game resolving? So suppose that we have this game tree on the left and it's too big for us to solve and the green things are what we call sub games. So we're gonna begin with something called a blueprint. And this blueprint is basically some baseline strategy that we're beginning with. So usually it's very difficult. It usually is gonna be the best strategy that we can compute offline. And typically the best way to do it is to solve a smaller extracted version of the game. So for example, in poker, I can limit the bet sizes to be some multiple, and that's gonna make the game tree much smaller so that we can solve, right? And that's gonna be our blueprint. And I'm going to follow this blueprint in actual play, right? Not hypothetically in actual play itself. So in this, I, I, I'm gonna follow that until I enter a sub game, right? So in this case, I took the left path and I entered the left sub game. So once I enter a sub game, I'm going to compute a refinement, a refined strategy for that sub game and for that sub game only. And this refined strategy is basically, basically an improvement over the blueprint. And I'm gonna follow that for the rest of the game. So the main point here is that we're only doing the refinement for that sub game and not the sub game on the right, right? Only the one that we enter in practice. So one important property is that of safety. And this is basically, uh, what happens, this safety property is obeyed when the refined strategy performs no worse than the blueprint. And that is something that we want because we expanded all this extra compute online. So if you do worse than the blueprint, which, which was our baseline to begin with, that's kind of uh, counterproductive, right? So we want this to happen. And um, one important point to note is that the follower actually best responds to the blueprint and the refined strategy. So this is as if the refinement source code was uploaded online. It's not just the blueprint. Right? And I will explain this in the next slide, which will tell us what happens during unsafe refinements. So this is, uh, again, another example that I'm playing around with. Um, this is what I call the hiring game. So pretend, you know, maybe that you are, maybe Penn State was trying to hire faculty, right? And, and, and you are playing the role of the hiring committee and the follower will be candidates which are applying for positions, right? So the question is, how should you conduct the hiring process? So, the game goes like this. It's going to start from chance, which is basically going to tell us whether or not a candidate is good or bad, right? This week's good and bad. And uh, regardless of whether it's good or bad, the candidates have an option to either pass or to apply, right? If they pass, the game just ends. If they apply, then they're going to go through a whole bunch of interview process. And um, over here in green, this is a sub game. And the, the, the values over here are not terminal states. They are basically the payoffs that, would have got, that you would have gotten under the blueprint, right? These are not terminal states. Now, uh, let's think about what happens when you follow the blueprint, right? Uh, the good candidates will apply, right? Because if they apply, they get a payoff of one, which is better than passing. And the bad candidates would choose to pass because if they apply, they get minus one, which is less than zero. So that's the intuition here. So on average, you're going to get a payoff of 0.5. You can compute that. Now, suppose Penn State decided to be a little bit too clever and decided to do some online refinement in a way that benefits, that they think benefits themselves. So maybe you, you know, don't fly the candidate over, you don't provide accommodation, that sort of thing. And suppose that if you under refinement, uh, these are the new payoffs, right? So at first glance, you might think this is a good idea because regardless of whether or not the candidate is good or bad, the leader, in this case, Penn State, is going to get more, more payoff, right? Two is greater than one and minus one is greater than minus two. But the reality is that it's not good because now the good candidates are not going to apply because they get a payoff of zero rather than, uh, they get a payoff of minus one rather than zero, and the bad candidates are going to apply. So it turns out that the leader's expected payoff is gonna be minus 0.5, which is less than the blueprint. So this is what we call unsafe search. So what's the problem here? The problem is that the actions pre-sub game move from the blue stuff to the red stuff, right? And that's causing a problem. And the solution is to just try to avoid, prevent that from happening. And the way to do that is carrots and sticks. If we make sure that in the refinement step, the good candidates get at least a payoff of zero and the bad candidates get a payoff of at most zero, then this will not happen, right? And if, so the, the, the idea here is to just enforce these carrots and sticks. Okay, so this is our algorithm. I won't go into it in detail, uh, but the idea is that first step, we are gonna compute these carrots and sticks using some very tedious method, but it's quite straightforward. And the second step, we're going to solve the equilibria, the solution to this game, uh, but have these carrots and sticks being enforced. Okay, so there are two methods to do so. 
in step two, either you can do it via, via mathematical programming or you can use something called a gadget, right? I won't go into detail in the interest of time. So here are some experiments. Um, this is made, this is done on a, a small game. We also tested it on games like poker, but over here, the result is clearer. So we tested it on four different game sizes, small, medium, large, and huge. And uh, we, com we are comparing this against the blueprint and also the full game solver, which we terminate after 1,000 seconds. So the first thing to note is that we perform always better. We always perform better than the blueprint. And that is just a property. It is just a, a consequence of safe because we guarantee that. And the second is that we notice that for smaller games, the full game solver just solved the entire game. So that's the optimal solution. Uh, but we are actually not far, not far behind. We're not a lot worse. Now, when the game is very large, then the full game solver has barely improves over the blueprint. In fact, the full game solver, if you don't initialize it with the blueprint, doesn't even come up with a feasible solution. Whereas our method actually uh, outperforms either of them by quite a large margin. Now, I actually don't know what is the true solution. I ran this for like days and I, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't give me any improvement. Uh, but the point is that we do quite a lot better um, than the alternatives. Okay, so we have a bunch of other contributions. Everything that I've said will also apply when there's imperfect information, like games like poker. Uh, but the big idea is, this, is the same, it's just carrots and sticks. Um, we can also apply this to more sophisticated equilibrium concepts, like correlated equilibrium. Um, I won't go into detail, obviously, it's quite complicated, but um, this is pretty impressive, the fact that we can do this, use this for uh, correlated strategies as well. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to function approximation for general sum games, and this is going to be the last part of the talk. Um, okay, so another method that's super popular today to try to solve large problems or games is that of function approximation. And for those of you who have heard of like alpha zero, alpha go, mu zero, this sort of thing, um, this is going to be uh, somewhat similar. So the problem is the same. We have a very large game. It might be too, too large to solve to traverse and maybe even too large to apply online solving as in the previous section. So what we can do is to instead exploit something called the value function, which is basically a function that tells us how good or how bad a particular state is. So over here, I have a simplified version of chess. I can take out any intermediate state, replace it by a terminal node. And if that approximate of how good or how bad it is, is accurate, then I can just solve this game and it will still give me the correct solution. And in fact, if I did that for all states past the particular depth, then that would be basically a classical method towards solving chess. All right, so previously this was done uh, used in uh, old methods like deep blue, where and we would actually handcraft some of these value functions. Um, today, we're going to use um, machine learning and neural networks to try to approximate these values, right? And in practice, they work really, really well. So the research question here is, how do we apply this method to solve these general sum games, or in this case, cycle of equilibrium, right? Is it as simple as just changing the internal nodes with terminal states? Now, it turns out that it's not that simple. Uh, we can do something similar, but it's not that straightforward. So I'm just going to illustrate this at a very high level, what's going on and why this is the case. So suppose I want to figure out, a, 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 I want to perform function approximation on this state C over there. By the way, this is just a disgruntled employee game again. So what I have in mind is to sort of chop this off and then rip out this sub game given in green and come up with a summary of it, right? And with this summary, I sh it should contain enough information to sort of transplant this on any other game uh, and, and, and we should still be able to solve it. So for example, the value of a game in chess is an appropriate sign, right? It contains enough information to solve this new transplanted game. Now, this summary should contain two, two, should obey two properties. The first is that it should be quite small, if possible. And the second is that it should be Markovian, which means that it should only depend on the green portions and not anything above or to the side of it. And that's something kind of sensible, right? The third thing that I want to point out is that this outside game in red over here, this transplanted game, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be zero and two. It doesn't have to be the original game. It can be something like K1 and K2. And this summary should still work. So it turns out that with this in mind, we can show that this summary cannot be a fixed size scalar or couple. In particular, it cannot be just any terminal state out there. And I'm just going to briefly illustrate a high level idea of why that is so. Okay, so consider all the possible uh, versions of this game where I change the payoff with, from zero and two to K1 and K2. 
So now I have a set of games. And I know that this summary, the same summary of the green part has to solve all possible, has, has to solve the game for all possible K1 and K2, right? And in particular, it should be able to answer the following question, right? Can, how much can the leader get in the sub game, assuming that we gave the follower at least K2? So that was actually what happened in the disgruntled employee game. We needed to think about whether or not we benefit from paying him to stay in the game, right? And we should be able to do this for all values of K2 with the same summary. So you think about it in this way, um, this summary has to basically allow us to query this for all, value, all possible values of K2, which means that we need to reason about the, po the pay possible payoff of the leader, assuming that you gave the leader a particular utility. So over here, I have a 2D graph. On the y-axis is the leader's utility. On the x, it will be the followers one. And I can achieve all the payoffs in the convex combination given by these two points over here, right? which are, which are the, 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 the leaf nodes in the green part. So this is what I call the enforceable payoff frontier, or the EPF. And it basically captures the trade-offs and utilities between the two players. Right? And if you go back to what I mentioned about general sum games, we need to take into account what the other player gets as well. It's not just about us. So as it turns out, um, the EPF is basically the summary of the state that we need to learn. And this would be analogous to the value of a game in chess. Right? The difference is that it's not a function. It's not just a simple scalar. So what can we do with this? Uh, we can write down Bellman equations. So for those of you who don't get intimidated by this, <laughs> like uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, Bellman equations basically tell us if I have a value of a particular state, can I represent it in terms of the value of the children's states? And over here, I have the same thing. If I have the EPF of a particular state, can I represent it by the EPF of its children's state? Right? And this is kind of like a local property that we want to have, uh, that the local relationship that we want to have. So this is very complicated. Obviously, I'm going to skip that. But my point is that this is roughly the same as the zero sum case, right? It's just more complicated. Now we have functionals rather than functions, but by and large, it's not a big deal. So once we have that, we can actually use uh, methods like fitted value iteration or any other supervised learning method out there that you used to try to solve chess. Uh, in particular, we can try to have a neural network that predicts EPFs from a particular state or state features. Right, so over here, we go from state features to the knots in this piecewise linear concave function, and that will be our approximate of the EPF. And once we have that, we can use this to minimize the Bellman loss, which is basically if I have a predicted EPF here, and I have a predicted EPF using one step look at it based on the equations in the previous slide, I can compare them, and if they are identical, then the loss is zero. If they're not identical, I can try to minimize this loss using gradient descent on the neural network. Uh, parameters, right? This is typically what you would do for um, in, in the alpha, mu, uh, alpha zero and so on and so forth. So one thing is that um, we have some theoretical guarantees and that is if the Bellman loss is very low, that means that the EPFs at every state from one step look at it and the predicted one are almost identical, then the strategy that we get from there will be approximately optimal as well. And that is very sensible, right? If you have a very low loss and your policy is very suboptimal, then you're not learning anything that's actually useful. So okay. that is pretty good. And uh, these guarantees are achieved by some careful, uh, careful choice of loss function and network design. So here are some experimental results. Uh, I won't go into the detail for that one. Um, yeah, I won't go into detail for this. But the idea here is that we have a pretty small game. Uh, small enough for us to compute the exact solution just for evaluation purposes. Um, and here is the EPF that we have on the root state, the initial state. And you can see that at least for the decreasing portion, which is what we are really interested in, the exact one and the predicted one and what we get from one step look ahead are almost identical. Okay, so that at least suggests that what we're learning at the root state is, is correct. And in practice, actually, what we see is that we get the optimal solution in almost all cases, or in almost all instances of this game. Now we also tested it on a much larger game. So this is a game that's so large that we cannot even traverse. I think it's like 10 to the 15 states or something, right? So we, we can't even store it. We have to do it implicitly. Uh, but there's some special structure that we can use to get the exact solution. This is for evaluation purposes only. And we again get the optimal strategy in almost all cases. And what's also interesting is that we can sort of parameterize this game by some features and have the payoffs depend on these parameters. And we can train on these features as well. And we're also able to generalize to the games 
with features that we haven't actually seen before um, during training. So there's some generalization going on um, in this setting. So before I end off uh, this portion, I'm going to sort of touch on the state of general sum game solving. Right? Recall that I mentioned right from the beginning that a lot of real world applications are general sum in nature. So having efficient solvers for them is, is kind of important. So here's a somewhat controversial take, and there's some people out there who disagree with me. So the first is that when the game is very small, uh, we should be able to solve it by mathematical programming. That one is easy. When this game is somewhat medium-sized, by medium-sized, I mean that it's small enough for us to traverse, but because the, the, the equilibrium concept is, is difficult, right? it's empty hard, uh, we can't solve it in, in, in realistically in, in a small amount of time. So in those areas, we can use sub-game solving to help us, as presented in the middle of the talk. Now, when the game is so large that we kind of cannot even traverse, then um, we are in deep learning land in some sense. We have to use something like function approximation. And I think, at least from my perspective, we are at this stage over here where we are at the precipice of sort of dealing with some of these really, really difficult problems. Now, we're not quite there. We're still very far off from that. There are still a lot of things we have to deal with. I made quite a bunch of assumptions that might not be realistic in real life. Um, there's also the problem of imperfect information, which I avoided entirely, at least in this piece of work. But uh, I think, at, <coughs> at least in the short term, it will be nice to have some kind of deep blue and deep stack algorithm for stack over games. So for those of you who don't know, Deep Blue is the IBM supercomputer that beat uh, Gary Kasparov many years back. And it was the first time a world champion defeated Deep Stack. It's a poker bot that um, performs very well against humans. And it would be nice to have one of these things off the shelf solvers for stack over games. I think that a lot of people uh, who are working in security games will appreciate that. And I, I know, I know they, they have a lot of trouble scaling up as well. So that's the end part. I think the main takeaway is that for general sum games, right, the state value is no longer just a single number or even a tuple, right? It's now an entire function, which can make things both more complicated but also more interesting. And I think that if you're trying to use machine learning, it might be useful to try to predict these set of values rather than a single value. So here are some future directions. Um, I won't go into things in too much detail. You can ask me more about it <laughs> in the future. Uh, I think there are a lot of algorithms that we can consider. Um, there are also lots of potential applications that are real world, uh, right? Sharing, community direction, and distributed systems. In particular, I think distributed systems is something that I, I'm curious about because I think uh, we oftentimes think about agents as robots or humans. You know, I think we can achieve a lot more when we think about them as like machines in a node or cluster or something like that. Um, there's also a very, very big problem that I'm also getting interested in, and that's interpretability. Right? I know this is a buzzword. You might try to put that down. But it's really important, right? especially in government applications, for example, high stakes applications, government, military applications. Um, it's super important. So here's a short story for myself. I'm from Singapore. So I have to serve in the military. It's mandatory. And this is actually the weapon that I offer. Right? It's, it's, it's an anti aircraft gun. And these are kind of settings. There's actually a strategic component to this. right? You, the aircraft might come from all possible areas, and you want to sort of camp and wait for it to come out. So there's a strategic component. But if your strategy is super complicated, use some of these methods that have in the past, I'm not going to execute it physically, right? There are actually human beings that are sort of executing these things. So we won't be able to do anything super complicated. The strategy that you give me has to be something that I can interpret and therefore execute. So I think these things are really important applications out there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things to be done. Um, I'm not sure about the background of this audience. Uh, another area that I think is really, really lacking is this part about modeling, right? Um, and in particular, how do you deal with things like bounded rationality of chaos, especially when it comes to general sum games, right? Um, in zero sum games, we always assume our opponent's super smart. That is to be safe. In general sum games, you assume that your opponent, in some sense, is super smart or not so smart. Either way can give you some either really good bad outcomes or some bad outcomes. So modeling that is really, really challenging, but I think it's important as well. And there's also an, an interesting problem with coordination, right? Um, which I won't get into in the interest of time. Uh, so here are some acknowledgments. I've worked with a bunch of people in the past, um, my advisors, some collaborators, and my thesis committee members. Um, it's a small group for senior students. So if you want to join this exclusive club, you can email me, I'll be happy to, to work with you. Right, and with that, I'll take some questions. Um, 
Okay, next will be our QA session. So if anyone has some questions, um, uh, if if uh, someone is online, you could uh, message your question in the chat box. If someone has question uh, in this room, so we can do that with them. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think um, was interesting for us when we started this project was that we really wanted to deal with the feature the feature setting. The feature setting is where um, yeah, you have some site information that you want to sort of adapt to, uh, even if you haven't seen it before. And the application back then, at least in the grant that was funding me, was cybersecurity. So we want to create the honeypot where you want to see what the heck, okay, what the attackers are trying to figure out, what the attackers are trying to get at, right? And your features will be something like your network architecture. It could be something like your, uh, sorry, the, the network topology. It could be something like your, your, your settings and your configurations, right? Because every network is different. But you want to figure out what they're trying to get regardless of what the network is. So that was the setting that actually motivated us. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but that, the end-to-end -end part is important because it allows for this, uh, this input of, of, of features, of this feature-wise setting. In the past, at least for games, there are methods to deal with. There are methods to learn games, but they never included the the the, the this this feature rights component, um, which I think it's 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 really important if you want to generalize. Yeah, I think um the Taiwan and Brian they also kind of like have similar kind of pipeline where they deal with these two stage problems, but they also try to back propagate the gradients. So is that Ryan Ryan Walker, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so is that kind of like related to your work or good question. Um I think the, I think the method is like something like learn and optimize, something along the way. Yes, lines. yes, but they also kind of like oh uh you know before it's like a kind of a two-stage problem. Right. First they learn and then they try to optimize that, but they basically try to back up in their gradient so that they can uh treat it as an experience problem. Yeah, um, I think it's very similar. In fact, I, I believe that their work cited us. Okay. <laughs> I think it came after us. But yeah, it, 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 it probably is, I haven't read it in detail, but it, it probably builds up on what we have. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your great talk. Thank you. uh, actually, I have two questions. Yep. Uh, first, actually, it's related to your second part of the presentation about the existence of the state refinement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm curious whether uh, there always be such kind of uh, state refinement, or any, if, if there's any some conditions that satisfy to existence of the state refinement. Because I think you only apply those methods in the Markov case. I don't know whether outside of that market, okay, you can see my problem. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the existence of a safe refinement is okay. It's trivially statistic. It trivially exists because you could always use the blueprint, right? So if your if your blueprint, I mean, your blueprint is always a possible refinement, and the blueprint is by definition safe because you can't afford to send it itself. So yeah, it will always exist uh, by that trivial definition. Um, in practice, oftentimes we see that there is an improvement, a, a, a notable improvement, but we, we can't guarantee, guarantee that you can do better. Right? If you could do better, then uh, I would use that as my blueprint instead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and whatever I said will also apply to extensive form games, not just Markov games. Um, yeah. Thank you. And, and for the third part of your work, uh, what is so you're mentioning basically, as far as I understand, you're using some kind of Okay, summary. Mm. And assume that you're using some kind of machine learning or design. Yes, exactly. But uh, in theory, uh, we also use some kind of subject of the equilibrium concept or backward, backward induction. So it's a proxy a little bit different, but still they're kind of summarizing the case yes. and then find the equilibrium path or, or entire entire equilibrium or op op optimized solution. So have you ever uh, compared your uh, proxy? Mm. Uh, between those two methods, and then, or can you, uh, can you 
verify that your method is always better than those kind of incorporate or network in the method. So actually you bring up a very good point. Uh I didn't have the detail, I didn't have time to go into the, the method in detail. Actually, actually, the brute force method to solve it, if the game tree was small, is actually backward induction. Right? It's backward induction, but not in the naive way that I gave in the interview. It was backward induction of these uh, EPFs. That's how you would do it normally. Right? Uh, the problem with that is that the game is too, too large, mm -hmm. and trying to do backward induction is, is a bit uh, challenging. Right? I think it can be up to quadratic in the size in, in the number of states. So that's not very, not very reasonable when you have like 10 to 15 states. Mm -hmm. So I can't really compare with that, because if you could do that exactly, then, then you should just do that. Right? The game is small enough to do that. Um, so that's why we have to do a uh, function approximation to deal with this, this, this massive size of the game. Um, on sub game solving or sub game perfect equilibrium. So what you have, um, I think what you're suggesting is that maybe we could do some kind of, um, something like what I did in the second part, but for this, for these very large games, it's possible, but I, I didn't run any experiments like that, but it's possible. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Uh, so what do I have another kind of question about the first part about the inverse game? Yeah. So um so what I understand is that uh so the so uh so basically you have a set of the functions, so the function formulated set, but so you want to learn the parameter. Yes. Uh for that setting, but isn't that is that assumption always true for like I, I understand for proper game it's yes. uh, true, but I think for a larger kind of more complicated problem. It's, yeah. So it's, yeah. that is uh, a very big problem. It's a very big issue. Um, so to summarize, I think to, to sort of reframe the question, mm -hmm. I think uh, what I assumed was that the players are playing according to the proper response equilibrium, which is like a, a regularized version of Nash. Right? And that's a very, very big assumption. I'm saying that the players are going to play according to this solution concept. Uh, in practice, especially when the game becomes general sum, uh, there are a ton of different solution concepts out there. Some of you might know about it, and you don't know which one to choose. That's a very big problem, and um, I don't have a solution to that, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it's something that I think there have been some follow-up work that deals with like correlated equilibria and trying to like max entropy, but it's actually a very difficult thing there. So that's why in the last slide, I mentioned that modeling of agents is, is something that's really important if you want to take this a step further. This was actually one of the reasons why I stopped working on this topic after about three years, because it was very, very difficult to actually analyze what humans did. You know, you collect all this data, if, if, if you take a lot of time collecting this data and they might not behave in any way that you think is reasonable, right? Humans are actually very fickle-minded. They, they don't really make sense sometimes, honestly speaking. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a tricky issue that I think will have to involve some kind of behavioral game theory or behavioral science. It's not just an algorithmic problem. I'll be very honest with that. Any more questions? Any more questions? Uh, okay, thanks for a Trump's talk today. And before ending today's talk, I need to mention one thing because uh, we have another uh, uh, we have another talk next. Uh, Oh, yeah, sorry. We, we have another talk with which is uh oh, next okay uh next Thursday. So one second. So we have another talk. Uh, oh yeah. You're good on Zoom. Like there is with that guy. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, we have another speaker from uh, Canary University, and she will talk about the topics related to AI ex uh, ex uh, explain, uh, ex explainability. So if you are interested about this, please consider attending. So, um, okay, so um, thank you again for Trent uh talk today. So we, we will end today's talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.